Well, we end today's show with the tragic news that Khalif Browder has committed suicide. He was a young New York student who spent three years in Rikers Island jail without being convicted of a crime. On Saturday, Khalif took his own life at his home in the Bronx. He was 22 years old. In 2010, when he was just 16, he was sent to Rikers Island without trial on suspicion of stealing a backpack. Earlier this year, the New Yorker obtained explosive video showing the violence to which Khalif was subjected to there. Surveillance camera footage shows him being abused on two separate occasions. In one clip from 2012, the teenager is seen inside Rikers Central Punitive Segregation Unit, better known as the Bing. As a guard escorts Khalif to the showers, uh, he, uh, Khalif appears to speak, and then the guard suddenly violently hurls him to the floor, although he's already handcuffed. Uh, in a separate video clip from 2010, Khalif is attacked by almost a dozen other teenage inmates after he punches a gang member who spat in his face. The other inmates pile onto Khalif and pummel him until guards finally intervene. Khalif's case led to calls for reforming New York's criminal justice system. On the night of his arrest years ago, Khalif Browder was walking home from a party with his friends in the Bronx May 15, 2010, when he was stopped by police based on a tip that he had robbed someone weeks earlier. He told HuffPost Live what happened next. They had searched me, and the guy actually said, at first he said, I robbed him, and I didn't have anything on me. And that's you when say nothing, you mean no weapon and none of his no property? No weapon, no money, anything he said that I allegedly robbed him for. So the guy actually changed up his story and said that I actually tried to rob him, and then another police officer came, and they said that, that um, I robbed him two weeks prior, and then they said, we're going to take you to the precinct, and most likely we're going to let you go home, and then I, I never went home. That's right. Khalif Browder did not return home for 33 months, almost three years, even though he was never tried or convicted. For nearly 800 days of that time, he was held in solitary confinement. He maintained his innocence, requested a trial, but was only offered plea deals while the trial was repeatedly delayed. Near the end of his time in jail, the judge offered to sentence him to time served if he entered a guilty plea and told him he could face 15 years in prison if he was convicted. He refused to accept the plea deal, was only released when the case was dismissed. We're joined once again by Jennifer Gonerman, reporter, author, contributing editor at New Yorker magazine. She was the first to report Khalif's suicide in her obituary for The New Yorker magazine on Sunday. She first recounted Khalif Browder's story last year in her article, Before the Law, a boy was accused of taking a backpack the courts took the next three years of his life. Welcome back to Democracy Now! Is it fair to say that the courts and the prison system actually took his life? You know, I don't know what was going through Khalif's mind in those last few minutes, but it's without a doubt that he was um, completely traumatized by those three years that you talked about, when he was trapped on Rikers Island, uh, despite never having been convicted of a crime, brutalized by um, officers and fellow inmates alike, as your, you know, as your viewers saw in that video footage that you guys showed. Now, he had attempted suicide while in jail numerous times as well. And after coming out, could you talk about that whole experience and process of what he what he told you about that? Certainly. He um, spent <clears throat> about two years in solitary confinement on Rikers Island and attempted to end his life several times while he was there and um, described some of those incidents for me. And I wrote about some of it in The New Yorker. And then after he was released, he was... Um, Released in 2013, several months later, he again made another very serious suicide attempt and spent about a week in a psychiatric hospital. And, and yet um, he tried, you know, every day to kind of beat back the nightmares um, and, and sort of transcend what he had lived through and, and make up for all this lost time. And he was, you know, in, in recent months, he was enrolled in college at Bronx Community College, and he was doing well. His, uh, I spoke to somebody there yesterday. He had a 3.5 GPA for this semester, which is extraordinary. I mean, he lost his junior year and his senior year of high school with, while he was locked up. So sort of every day he was sort of grappling with sort of trying to, you know, move past what he had endured. But I guess the trauma was too much. I want to turn back to Khalif Browder in his own words. In this December 2013 interview with HuffPost Live's Mark Lamont Hill, Browder talked about his suicide attempts at Rikers and his efforts to get psychiatric help. I would say I committed suicide about five to six, five or six times. Okay, you attempted suicide five to six times? Yes. While all, in, while, all while still in prison? Yes. Wow. And I, 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 try, I tried to resort to 
telling the correction officers that I wanted to um, see a psychiatrist or a counselor, something. I was telling them I need mental health because I wasn't feeling right. All, all the stress from my case, everything was just getting to me, and I just, I just couldn't take it. I just needed somebody to talk to. I needed to just let, let, let. I just needed to be. I just needed to talk and be stress free. But the correction officers, they didn't want to hear me out. Nobody wanted to listen. That is Khalif Browder. Now, again, he went to jail when he was 16 years old, never was tried. He was—the judge said he could get out if he just pled out. And he said, no, I'm not guilty. And that moment actually happened. He had been locked up for, you know, over two and a half years at that moment. So he had gone through all this incredible trauma and was given a chance to walk out the door. And almost anybody would take that opportunity, just put in the guilty plea to anything, just to get home. He refused. He said, I did nothing wrong. And he just wanted that trial. He hung himself on Saturday? Yeah. If there's a, any positive uh, sense of that can come out of this is the reforms that have uh, have resulted uh, not only from his experience but from your chronicling of his experience could you talk about what the city of New York has tried to do in in recent months to reform especially how it handles juveniles uh, in the in its jail system you know there's been a number of reforms uh, or attempts at reforms in recent months um, at the end of last year, the mayor eliminated solitary confinement for or juvenile offenders on Rikers Island. Because uh, of Khalid? I think that was part of it. That wasn't the only contributing factor. I mean, the New York Times has been doing very aggressive coverage about the outrages on Rikers Island. Um, but Mayor B Bill de Blasio did cite uh, Khalif's case a couple months ago when he talked about a new initiative to try to speed up court cases, especially in the Bronx, but across the city. And that sort of excessive court delays that have been going on, that was part of the reason he spent so much time in jail there trying to address that. Now, whether these reforms are going to lead to lasting change, I don't know. I mean, we can only sort of hope that, that you know, that uh, his death is not in vain and that real systemic change happens. As we just briefly said what happened to him in jail, aside from just being jailed at all, these videos that came out that we had you on for when they came out, very unusual to get a video from inside, mm -hmm. a guard taking him down, uh, the other prisoners beating him up. I mean, it almost defies belief. You know, he had told me from the first moment I met him stories about being abused on Rikers Island, um, and I never doubted him for a moment. But I think, as an outsider, it's almost impossible to believe what he lived through. And when you see it on those videos, I mean, it was disturbing to watch those videos several months ago when we put them online. But to watch them now in the wake of what happened, I mean, it's almost, it, it's just, it's, almost, it's just unbelievable. And you reviewed the videos with him uh, before deciding whether to publish them right. or post them or not. What was, could you talk about his reaction seeing, seeing the, or reliving it through the, through the video as well, the, what yeah, happened to him? Yeah, you know, the, from the first moment I met him, he said, Jen, you have to get that video from September 23rd, 2012, when this officer sort of threw me to the ground and assaulted me. And I thought, how am I going to get that video? And then I thought, how does he know the exact date? You know, and he remembered he had an incredible recall for details and dates and for what had happened to him. And he knew that this assault had happened right on camera. And I sat next to him and he watched it um, a few months ago. And, you know, on the one hand, it's like incredibly disturbing to watch. And on the other hand, he was gratified that finally people were going to know exactly what happened to him. Um, and it was just... You know, it was the whole thing is just so, so disturbing. It's almost beyond words. Was he suing the New York City system? Yeah. He, he, he has been for, you know, um, almost two years, had a lawsuit against New York City, against the Department of Corrections, the district attorney, for his case, hoping to get some justice. And like his criminal case, his civil case has been dragging on and on. And he's been through, you know, many days of depositions, which essentially means sitting in a room with city lawyers and being grilled about exactly what happened, including being grilled about his suicide attempts on Rikers Island. So he is survived by his mom. Uh, and could you talk about his family? You spent this weekend a uh, number of hours there. His family is, is his very— His mother is who found him. Right. His family is very private and um, didn't want to, you know, be public or talk publicly about what happened. But as you can imagine, is, is completely—appeared to be completely devastated and confused and angry, as you would imagine, you know, by, by, this, by this tragedy. And was he under under treatment for uh, depression, or was he on was he had, had prescription drugs as a result of his his uh, numerous uh, suicide attempts? Yeah, no, he was he was uh, had some was getting some treatment and was on um, medication at the time and had been for many months. 
Well, Jennifer Gonerman, your work in introducing the world to Khalif is so important, and I'm so sad that we have lost him now at the age of 22. Jennifer Gonerman is staff writer for The New Yorker magazine. She was the first to report uh, Khalif Browder's suicide in her obituary for him in The New Yorker on Sunday. She previously recounted Khalif's story in the article headlined Before the Law, A Boy Was Accused of Taking a Backpack. The courts took the next three years of his life, and we'll link to that story. That does it for our broadcast. If you'd like to get a copy, go to democracynow.org. Democracy Now! is produced by Mike Burke, Renee Feltz, Aaron Mate, Nermeen Sheikh, Steve Martinez, Sam Alkoff, Hani Massoud, Robbie Karen, Dina Guzder, Amy Littlefield, Anna Ozbeck, Mike Filippo, Miguel Naguera, Engineer. Special thanks to Julie Crosby. I'm Amy Goodman with Long.